Okay, so thank you so much for, for um, I think, Claudia, for bringing me to this meeting. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about intimate partner violence in India, which uh, I think a lot of you have probably been reading about over the last year and a half or so. It's partly why I'm here, because I think the, the conference felt like we, we needed to have some discussion about India. So I'll talk a little bit about scale, uh, the scale of intimate partner violence and a little bit about what the national response has been. Uh, and then I'm going to focus on using health as an entry point and describe to you specifically some of the work that I've been doing in the southern city of Bengaluru or Bangalore, which is the, the English, the British name, uh, with the municipal corporation. So I am going to be focusing on an urban health systems response to violence against women and keeping in mind that this may not actually be, uh, be scalable across the country. Um, so in terms of IPV in India, according to the um, National uh, Crime Records Bureau, and so this is data that's probably not highly accurate. Despite that, the National Crime Records Bureau has um, reported that all forms of violence against women have increased by about 70% over the last decade. Cruelty against women by husbands or relatives has in fact increased by 120% in the past decade. Of the nearly 25,000 rapes reported in India in um, the year of 2012, 98% of offenders were known to the women. Only 1% of victims actually report sexual violence to the police. And we had 25,000 reported cases. Marital rape, mind you, is not a crime in India. So this, these are, the, the rapes are not actually conduct, uh, perpetrated by husbands, um, but by individuals known to women, and marital rape is not considered a crime. Um, so intimate partner violence, um, so we're talking about intimate partner violence in India. India is the, I'm sure everyone's aware, the most pop, uh, second most populous country in the world, 1.2 billion people. Women continue to marry young. The average age at marriage is about 17 years. Nationally representative survey, which was conducted actually 10 years ago, estimated that 40% or two out of five women had experienced intimate partner violence. Intimate partner violence has also been documented among pregnant women. For example, 40% of women seeking care at a hospital in Delhi reported experiencing intimate partner violence during pregnancy. Now, the global, local, um, and national media have been reporting uh, violence, especially after the death of the young woman in Delhi uh, at the end of 2012. And these are just some of the local reports um, that we've been collating uh, in, in Bengaluru. What's interesting is that this global media attention has finally captured the attention of the political leadership. And for the very first time, we have a prime minister who refers to the issue of rape in India in an Independence Day speech, which is a big deal. On the ramparts of the Red Fort in Delhi, he says, today when we hear about these rapes, our heads hang in shame. Now, he goes on to say other things, which perhaps are not particularly evidence-based, and I'm not going to go into it, but we can discuss it. <laughs> but at least he acknowledges that this is a shameful um, phenomenon. Now, turning to what has actually happened, if you look at the policy context in India, we're actually not that badly off. We um, you know, have a Dowry Pro a Prohibition Act. Um, India was a signatory to, the, uh, to CEDAW, uh, announced a national policy for the empowerment of women in 2001, has had a number of amendments uh, made to the Divorce and Marriage Acts. Of course, marital rape is still not a crime. We had the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act in 2005, which was basically to also expand women's access to, to justice without having to get into the criminal uh, system. So this allows women to seek help at a police station, to have a protection order issued. It gives her the right to remain in her marital home, because mind you, in India, once you're married, you no longer you don't, allow, you don't belong to your natal family anymore. You belong to your marital family. So it gives her the right to remain in her marital home until some sort of resolution is obtained. Um, the National Mission for the Empowerment of Women was launched recently and has the explicit uh, aim of bringing together intersectoral collaboration to address the issue of women's empowerment. So these are very positive developments. Um, and yet, you see the, the statistics. Um, violence against women is, is, is continuing. Um, interestingly, in the aftermath of the December 2012 death, 
um, the Prime Minister, uh, they've, ish they've set up a fund called the Nirbhaya Fund. Nirbhaya is the name that was given to this woman um, in, the, in, in the media. And the fund is actually going to, is aimed at setting up 100 one-stop crisis centers, whether they work or not. They're going to set up 100 one-stop crisis centers, and it's an investment of about 100,000 UK pounds. Um, so, so this is the broader context um, in, which, in which we're working. Now I'm going to turn to my own research, uh, which began um, well in the late 90s when I did ethnographic and epidemiological research on women's reproductive and sexual health in rural India. But really it was officially launched after my PhD in 2001 and was this multi-year, mixed methods, multi-phased study which aimed to look at the impact of gender inequalities and the pathways through which gender inequalities lead to adverse sexual reproductive health outcomes among women. It was originally funded by NIH, has had a number of other um, funding after that, but sort of a series of, of mini studies, qualitative uh, longitudinal study of young married women, and I'll show you some of the results from that original longitudinal study, and then quite a bit of qualitative research after the longitudinal study to explore some of the results in greater depth. The overall objective was to characterize the impact of gender equalities on women's health and to assess uh, the feasibility and effectiveness of a range of potential interventions to empower women and promote their health. Um, the work has been conducted in low-income neighborhoods in Bangalore. Uh, about one in five um, residents of Bangalore or Bengaluru live in, in slums or low-income neighborhoods. These are not um, you know, informal settlements. These are formal settlements. They have uh, health services in the bottom um, left-hand corner. You'll see this entrance to a, a municipal primary health center. There's a network of 60 such centers throughout the city, initially set up with World Bank funding, actually, uh, but now run by the municipal corporation. And the centers all look like this, a big uh, reception hall, rooms off to the side which afford privacy. No um, deliveries occur in these health centers. They are basically focused on antenatal care, um, some postnatal care immunization, family planning, and more recently, they also have been engaged in TB, malaria, chikungunya, and so on treatment. Um, our longitudinal st uh, study of 750 women between the ages of 16 and 25 years found that um, over 50 percent had ever been hit, kicked, or beaten at the time of enrollment into the study. Of those who had disclosed a history of violence, about half of them went on to experience violence during the longitudinal um, research. 20% of them newly disclosed violence over the two-year follow-up period. By study exit, 77% had ever experienced physical, psychological, or sexual violence perpetrated by their husband or other member of their um, marital family. So this was really an astounding result. And I can talk to you about some of the ethics of doing this research, which is where I've been very concerned about the issue of research and harm, since that's mm -hmm. something we can talk about. Um, but to zoom forward, women responded to and resisted IPV in a number of ways. Um, they sought external help, they sought help from within the family, primarily viewed violence as a family matter. Um, they did fight back verbally, they contemplated or attempted suicide. They also used other forms of resistance, avoiding eating, ignoring their husband, and so on. If you look at amongst those who had actually sought help from a human being, one received support of, this is 750, so it's right at the end of the study. Um, I don't remember the exact ends, but this was a pretty small number. In addition, we also conducted, this was research done by Karuna Chibber, who was doing her PhD at Berkeley. We did a study of public and private sector primary healthcare providers working in these slums that we, we were working in to understand their perception of violence against women and how it was impacting women's health. And we found, surprisingly, that in fact, primary care physicians almost uniformly Rec recognized and acknowledged violence, um, intimate partner violence, as a big health risk amongst their population. Twelve uh, were actually actively engaged in a range of responses. They were noting indications of DV, so it's case finding. It's in the context of providing family planning, antenatal care, etc., that they were picking up on, asking indirect questions to assess violence and asking direct questions when it seemed like women were comfortable and were willing to open up. 
uh, devising innovative ways to screen, listening actively, informing patients. When women didn't seem to be disclosing, but they had a strong suspicion, they would typically, the ones who are aware, would inform them of the, uh, of the law. Some of them made referrals to NGOs that they identified in their local communities, and they sought opportunities to improve. So they wanted more training, and they sought opportunities for training. We also found through this research that the success of a primary healthcare response really was going to depend on confidence and trust in the healthcare provider, which was promoted by the familiarity. So these were all physicians who were working for a long period of time in these slums and had a rapport with women in the community. Being female it, uh, was, was key. Um, uh, women said that they would disclose if they thought the provider was in a position to help. What's the point of telling this doctor if she isn't going to be able to do anything anyway? Um, assuring privacy and confidentiality was really important. And having some awareness of gender equity issues, you know, such as patriarchy and women's rights, definitely promoted a response. So providers who were more entrenched in you know, gender inequitable ideas uh, of, of women and violence were less likely, of course, to be engaging in these kinds of, of um, actions. So this is just to show you that out of this sort of eight, 10 year long observational research, um, we've developed a whole range of, of interventions, but I'm just focusing on the last one. So this is the one that's working with the Bengaluru Municipal Health System, was actually funded by the Indian Council of Medical Research, which I think is also really important to acknowledge. Um, and this was through a mechanism to promote women's sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, very interesting that ICMR felt that this was an important issue. Um, and the three objectives were to develop and implement an intervention to build the capacity of the primary healthcare system to promote women's sexual and reproductive health and rights, and placing intimate partner violence as a violation of women's sexual and reproductive health and rights. So that's how we positioned IPV. Um, through the development and implementation of this pilot intervention, we uh, were going to then assess the impact on primary healthcare workers' knowledge, attitudes, and practices, and to a limited extent explore some of the impacts of the intervention, at least on women's awareness of their rights. And you'll see this is really a very formative work. I'd be curious to see if Rachel thinks we should keep doing it or not uh, when, she sees, when she sees the data that we have. So we started with an intensive year-long formative um, uh, period where we actually engaged, we developed program advisory groups comprising the three cadres of the municipal health system, physicians, nurses, nurse midwives, and community outreach workers. We took them on retreats. We had a number of meetings with them as well as with the leadership of the health system to develop the contours of the capacity building intervention, which included training, networking with local resource organizations, and then ongoing mechanisms for ongoing support. Um, and based on that, we came up with an intervention curriculum, the number of hours we were going to devote, et cetera. We engaged in phased implementation. We worked in three zones of Bangalore, which actually has eight zones, but the original city of Bangalore was three zones. So we worked in those because that's where the health system is the strongest. And we conducted it zone by zone so that when we completed the training in one zone, the lessons learned from that zone were then incorporated. So by the end of the project, the, what the idea was that we'd have a curriculum and an approach, a manual actually for training that was fairly well refined. Um, and then we engaged in ongoing advocacy with the municipality. So throughout, we were actually promoting the municipality to adopt a policy because one of the things we heard from the formative work with physicians was that unless this is mandated, we are not going to do it. So we need it to be mandated. We need uh, our activities to be reported and reviewed um, on an ongoing basis. So here's the intervention. We drew on um, work that Bridget McCaw has done at Kaiser Permanente in, the, in their Northern California family violence prevention, um, their response, which is basically taking a systems approach to promoting a healthcare response. And we try to address all these different components of a, of a systems approach. So as far as, as I mentioned, we had a leadership and oversight group, which comprised of these different program advisory groups. We had a small core training group. These were really expert trainers from an organization called Sehat in Mumbai, which has run one of the longest, uh, was for many years the only one-stop crisis center working also in a municipal corporation setting in Mumbai. So they were our expert trainers. And then we engaged in both qualitative and quantitative data collection for monitoring and evaluation purposes. The heart of the intervention is this whole process of case finding, response, and on-site services. So we had very clearly specified roles, although this is sort of disintegrated, because actually these frontline health workers don't 
behave in the ways they said they behaved, in that they don't actually have clearly specified roles. One is we discovered physicians are really just the enablers. They're the leaders. Um, they don't do any of the day-to-day -day work. Um, a physician in the municipal health system actually is in charge of three or four health centers. Plus, she may be in charge of mosquito control, food safety, other things for a city, mind you, of 10 and a half million. So these physicians are really not in a position to, to implement, but we see them as enablers. So the, the heart of the program really is working with nurses, nurse midwives, and community outreach workers. And basically the training focuses on issues of gender, understanding gender, patriarchy, violence, and then goes into how do you integrate violence, inquiry, identification into your day-to-day -day because we cannot introduce it as a separate activity. Nobody's going to do it. it. If it's seen as something that can facilitate the work that they're doing already, then it's much more acceptable. So saying that, for example, if you address the issue of violence, maybe she's going to be able to come uh, to antenatal care, you know, do her antenatal care visits more regularly, you're going to be able to actually help her out. Um, so we have a protocol, but it's a flexible protocol. It's really guidelines for inquiry and assessment. Um, so we emphasize the principles of inquiry and assessment. We found that providers have different ways of asking. This mirrors what we heard in the formative study, that each of them, they tailor their uh, form of inquiry to that particular woman and that particular context. So you can't protocol them too much because they're not going to adhere to it anyway. So, um, so you really need to emphasize on rapport building, listening, looking at privacy, ensuring confidentiality, and so on. Affirmation, OK, these are the key messages. Now we have this first line support sort of document, a protocol, which is built off of what um, Claudia and WHO have developed. So it's about assessment of safety, providing information on rights, making referrals that are appropriate. We do have on call on mobile phone um, counselors from the project. So these are not municipal staff. But otherwise, everything else is using resources in the system, meaning healthcare workers that are already there, and then referring to organizations that are already there. And I can always I can talk about those aspects too. So um, we also have these posters which are attempting, they're in Canada, they're, but I've put the English version here for you to see, um, in the clinic to show that there are many posters in the clinic about nutrition, antenatal care, and so on and so forth. So this is, another, this is to send the message that this is an issue we deal with in the clinic. Um, community outreach is done by health workers. The referral services, we have organizations. Because we're in the city of Bengaluru, we have organizations that we can refer to. This is very key. We use the Santwana centers. The Santwana centers actually work, are funded by the Department of Women and Child Development, and they're the centers actually tasked with the implementation of the, of the Domestic Violence Act. Those are the ones that we end up using the most. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. And, and so to sum up what actually happens in the clinic, what's supposed to happen is that link workers and nurses are supposed to be sort of integrating domestic violence awareness into their activities focused on increasing awareness about antenatal care and immunization, that's actually not happening. Um, they, uh, th the way they communicate about ANC and immunization is actually very different from the way they need to communicate about domestic violence, and so we're still figuring that out. But somehow, word, of, word is getting out that this is happening, and you will see that women are actually coming in and disclosing um, that they're experiencing domestic violence. Um, typically, or wh what we've encouraged providers to do is use indirect questioning, then depending on their rapport, the privacy, et cetera, they may get into, into more direct questioning and at all times provide some of the messages from the first line support. Okay, so what we did was we, as I said, we did phased implementation in the three zones. We did uh, repeated surveys and because of resource constraints, this is not the ideal design, it's a little. So we had before and after surveys, basically, we had some zones where some you know, training had happened, some zones where it hadn't happened, and over time. So it's a little complicated, not very clean, but um, I'm going to try and make, uh, put out the simple story. So the simple story is that survey data indicate that the intervention really did improve. To some extent, providers' knowledge and attitudes, maybe practices, You'll see in the exit interviews with women that perhaps their practices really did change a little bit. At the end of it, um, providers did feel, and this is interesting based on the, the um, talk about the police this morning, this idea that 
uh, that police or in this case health workers feel that they can do something about intimate partner violence, I think that is really important. It's something that we have found. When we start the training, they say, oh, this is too complicated. You know, we can do antenatal care immunization, IPV, forget it, domestic violence. That's a social problem, not our problem. But, you know, taking them through these exercises, at the end of it, they do feel more capable of supporting women. And um, we used a scale, we adapted a scale developed by Lynn Short in the US, um, and the scale seems to work fairly well. Okay, so, all right, so you're gonna see, um, here, here's the, the exit interviews with the women. So we had exit interviews, you'll see at the top that women, so this is as women leave the primary health center, we just do a short interview with them. Their awareness of different types of violence went up. Um, they reported being asked about problems at home. So this is one of the most common ways in which the indirect inquiry happens is, are you okay at home? Are you having problems in your marital home? 87% um, felt that questions about problems should be asked. Interestingly, at Endline, actually that went down. So that's something we're still investigating. Um, felt that the clinic was capable of providing help. Okay. Here, um, so we've, uh, we've actually, so there were many cases who were, who disclosed um, and were provided some information and went away without really receiving anything more. Documentation was really poor. Um, it's a persistent problem. 80 cases were actually referred to the project counselors. And you'll see here that 36% of the 80 actually uh, presented or disclosed without much prompting at all. 16% identified in immunization, and that's actually where the nurses feel most comfortable doing case identification. So this, uh, because what they do is they use child mal mal uh, malnourishment as a trigger to start inquiring about marital problems and what's going on at home. Okay. Um, challenges. So lots and lots of challenges, some ways in which you're responding to them, motivating providers to continue to do this, sustaining the excitement that our training to some extent generates. Um, this is where the policy becomes really important. Um, enhancing their skills to actually respond in a systematic way. So we're not asking you to systematically identify, use all these different ways to, to identify, but respond systematically. We're actually using mHealth, I won't get to it probably, but we have various mHealth applications we're, we're developing here. Um, encouraging women to seek help. So this has to be accompanied, we know, by greater community engagement. It's something that we're working on. The health system isn't in a good place to do that. Maintaining an active network of willing and able service providers, really tough. Even in Bangalore, getting, for example, organizations that link up women to the, uh, to the legal system, they, they're just not there. Um, sidestepping overcoming systems problems such as low wages, erratic payment, especially to the community health workers who actually do a lot of the identification, even though they're not the ones who are actually doing the healthcare provision. Um, weak monitoring systems, frequent changes in leadership, 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 leadership. I can't say enough about how actually how critical that piece is. We actually have a commissioner who's very, very committed. Okay, so um, I think maybe I'll stop here. This is just a, a slide on. Um, on the M trainer, and here are some of the, the key policy actions. Um, I mean, what we're working on in terms of advocacy is really uh, using, now wanting to use the World Health Assembly to, to have a health systems commitment. Um, we feel the WHO guidelines need to be adapted, and maybe even to local context, rural and urban. Um, having resources um, is, is a big, I mean, resource limitations are a big, big challenge. Um, supporting research, and, and this is, you know, somewhat implementation research, although there isn't a whole lot of rigorous evidence that we're necessarily translating here. But what we're trying to do is um, trying to generate evidence in a real-world scenario. So I didn't start, in other interventions that I've done, I've started with an RCT, but in this one, I've started with, um, with the real world. Great. Thank you very much. Sorry. Real world. Real world.